Big Star was an American rock band formed in Memphis, Tennessee, in 1971 by Alex Chilton, Chris Bell, Jody Stevens, and Andy Hummel. The group broke up in 1974, but reorganized with a new lineup nearly 20 years later. In its first era, the band's musical style drew on the vocal harmonies of the Beatles, as well as the swaggering rhythms of the Rolling Stones and the jangling guitars of the Birds. To the resulting power pop, Big Star added dark, existential themes, and produced a style that foreshadowed the alternative rock of the 1980s and 1990s. Before it broke up, Big Star created a seminal body of work that never stopped inspiring succeeding generations in the words of Rolling Stone, as the quintessential American power pop band, and one of the most mythic and influential cult acts in all of rock and roll. Big Star's first album a Euro 1972's number one record a Euro was met by enthusiastic reviews, but ineffective marketing by Stax Records and limited distribution stunted its commercial success. Frustration took its toll on band relations, and by the time a second album was completed in 1974 both Bell and Hummel had left the group. Like No. 1 a record, Radio City received excellent reviews, but label issues again thwarted sailors a Euro Columbia Records, which had assumed control of the Stax catalogue, likewise effectively vetoed its distribution. After a third album was deemed non-commercially viable and shelved before receiving a title, the band broke up late in 1974. Four years later, the first two Big Star LPs were released together as a double album. The band's third album was finally issued soon afterward. Entitled Third Sister Lovers, it found limited commercial success. Shortly thereafter, Chris Bell was killed in a car accident at the age of 27. The Big Star discography drew renewed attention in the 1980s when R.E.M. and other popular bands cited the group as an influence. In 1992, interest was further stimulated by Recodisc's reissues of the band's albums, complemented by a collection of Bell's solo work. In 1993, Chilton and Stevens reformed Big Star with recruits John Auer and Ken Stringfellow of the Posies, and gave a concert at the University of Missouri. The band remained active, performing tours in Europe and Japan, and released a new studio album, In Space, in 2005. Chilton died on March 17, 2010, after being admitted to a New Orleans hospital with heart problems. Hummel, who was diagnosed with cancer in 2008, died on July 19, 2010. These deaths left Stevens as the sole surviving founding member. First Era 1971 to 1974, formation of the band, Alex Chilton was the lead singer for the blue-eyed soul group The Box Tops from 1967 to 1970 when the band had a no A1 hit with the song The Letter, at the age of 16. Following his stint with The Box Tops, he recorded a solo studio album. He was offered the role of lead vocalist for Blood, Sweat and Tears, but turned the offer down as too commercial. Chilton had known Chris Bell for some time, both lived in Memphis, each had spent time recording music at Ardent Studios, and each, when aged 13, had been struck by the music of the Beatles during the band's 1964 debut U.S. tour. A song Chilton wrote nearly six years after he first witnessed a Beatles performance, 13, referred to the event with the line Rock and Roll is here to stay. Chilton asked Bell to work with him as a duo modeled on Simon and Garfunkel. Bell declined, but invited Chilton to a performance by his own band, Icewater, comprising Bell, drummer Jody Stevens, and bassist Andy Hummel. Attracted by Icewater's music, Chilton showed the three his new song Watch the Sunrise, and was asked to join the band. Both Watch the Sunrise, and Thirteen were subsequently included on Big Star's first album. Number one a record. The now four piece band adopted the name Big Star when one member was given the idea from a grocery store often visited for snacks during recording sessions. One of many Big Star markets outlets in the Memphis region at the time, it had a logo consisting of a five pointed star enclosing the words Big Star. As well as the store's name, the band used its logo but without the word star to avoid infringing copyright. Number one record. Although all four members contributed to songwriting and vocals on the first album, 
Chilton and Bell dominated as a duo intentionally modeled on John Lennon and Paul McCartney. The album was recorded by Ardent founder John Ferry, with Terry Manning contributing occasional backing vocals and keyboards. The title number one a record was decided towards the end of the recording sessions and evinced, albeit as a playful hope rather than a serious expectation, the chart position to be achieved by a big star. Although prior Euro at the band's insistence Euro was credited as executive producer, publicly he insisted that the band themselves really produced these records. Fry recalled how Ardent, one of the first recording studios to use a 16-track tape machine, worked experimentally with the band members, we started recording the songs with the intent that if it turned out okay we'd put it out. I wound up being the one that primarily worked on it, I recorded all the tracks and then they would often come late at night and do overdues. One by one, they all learned enough engineering. Describing the mix of musical styles present on number one record, Rolling Stone's Bud Scopper notes that the album includes reflective and acoustic numbers, saying that even the prettiest tunes have tension and subtle energy to them, and the rockers reverberate with power. Scopper finds that in each mode, the guitar sound is sharp-edged and full. Number One A Record was released in April 1972, and quickly received strong reviews. Billboard went as far as to say, every cut could be a single. Rolling Stone judged the album exceptionally good, while Cashbox stated, this album is one of those red-letter days when everything falls together as a total sound, and called it an important record that should go to the top with proper handling. Proper handling, however, was not forthcoming, Stax Records proved unable to either promote or distribute the record with any degree of success, and even when the band's own efforts to get airplay generated interest, Fans were unable to buy it as Stax could not make it available in many stores. Stax, in an effort to improve its catalog's availability, signed a deal with Columbia Records, already successful distributors in the U.S., making Columbia responsible for the entire Stax catalog. But Columbia had no interest in dealing with the independent distributors previously used by Stax and removed even the existing copies of number one record from the stores. Radio City the frustration at number one records obstructed sales contributed to tension within the band. There was physical fighting between members, Bell, after being punched in the face by Hummel, retaliated by smashing Hummel's new bass guitar to pieces against the wall. Hummel took revenge at a later date, finding Bell's acoustic guitar in the latter's unattended car, he repeatedly punched it with a screwdriver. In November 1972, Bell quit the band. When work continued on songs for a second album, Bell rejoined, but further conflict soon erupted. A master tape of the new songs inexplicably went missing, and Bell, whose heavy drug intake was affecting his judgment, attacked Fry's park car. In late 1972, struggling with severe depression, Bell quit the band once more, and by the end of the year Big Star disbanded. After a few months Chilton, Stevens and Hummel decided to reform Big Star, and the three resumed work on the second album. The title chosen, Radio City, continued the play on the theme of a big star's popularity and success, expressing what biographer Robert Gordon calls the band's romantic expectation. As Hummel put it, This was probably pretty lame, but in those days putting any word in front of the noun city to sort of emphasize the totality and pervasiveness of it was just a way of talking people had. If someone suggested going to a store but you had gotten a bad deal there you might say, oh no, that place is rip-off city. Calling an LP Radio City would be kind of wishful thinking. I mean we hoped it would be played on the radio a lot, making it Radio City. Of course it didn't pan out that way. Stevens recalled, Radio City, for me, was just an amazing record. Being a three-piece really opened things up for me in terms of playing drums. Drums take on a different role in a three-piece band, so it was a lot of fun. Radio City was really more spontaneous, and the performances were pretty close to live performances. Although uncredited, Bell contributed to the writing of some of the album's songs, including Oh My Soul, and Back of a Car. Shortly before the album's release, Hummel left the band, judging that it would not last, and in his final year at college, he elected to concentrate on his studies and live a more normal life. 
he was replaced by John Lightman for a short tenure prior to the band dissolving. Rolling Stone's Ken Barnes, describing the musical style of Radio City, opens by noting as a backdrop that the band's debut, Number One A Record, established it as one of the leading new American bands working in the mid-60s pop and rock vein. Radio City, Barnes finds, has plenty of shimmering pop delights, although the opening tune, Oh My Soul, is a foreboding, sprawling funk affair. Barnes concludes that sometimes they sound like the birds, sometimes like the early Who, but usually like their own indescribable selves. Radio City was released in February 1974 and, like number one a record, received excellent reviews. Record World reported, the sound is stimulating, the musicianship superb, and the result is tight and rollickingly rhythmic. Billboard judged it a highly commercial set. Rolling Stone's Bud Scopper, then with Phonograph Record, affirmed, Alex Chilton has now emerged as a major talent, and he'll be heard from again. Cashbox called it a collection of excellent material that hopefully will break this deserving band in a big way. But just as number one a record had fallen victim to poor marketing, so too did Radio City. Columbia, now in complete control of the Stax catalog, refused to process it following a disagreement. Without a distributor, sales of Radio City, though far greater than those of number one a record, were minimal at only around 20,000 copies. Third Sister Lovers In September 1974, eight months after the release of Radio City, the two remaining members of Big Star returned to Ardent Studios to work on a third album. Chilton and Stevens were assisted by producer Jim Dickinson and an assortment of musicians including drummer Richard Rosie Brawl, and Lisa Aldridge, Chilton's girlfriend, who contributed on vocals. The sessions and mixing were completed in early 1975, and 250 copies of the album were pressed with plain labels for promotional use. Park Putterball of Rolling Stone described Third Sister Lovers as extraordinary. It is, he wrote, Chilton's untidy masterpiece. Beautiful and disturbing. Vehemently original. Of haunting brilliance. To listen to it is to be plunged into a maelstrom of conflicting emotions. Songs are drenched in strings and sweet sentiment one minute, starkly played and downcast the next. No pop song has ever bottomed out more than Holocaust, an anguished plaint sung at a snail's pace over discordant slide guitar fragments and moaning cello. On the upside, there's the delicious pop minuet stroke at Noel, the anticipatory magic of nighttime. Big Star's Baroque, guitar-driven pop reaches its apotheosis on songs like Kiss A Me, Thank You Friends, and Oh, Dana. Without question, Third is one of the most idiosyncratic, deeply felt and fully realized albums in the pop idiom. Fry and Dickinson flew to New York with promotional copies and met employees of a number of record labels, but could not generate interest in the album. When a similar promotion attempt failed in California, the album was shelved as it was considered not commercial enough for release. Fry recalled, we'd go in and play it and these guys would look at us like we were crazy. In late 1974, before the album was even named, the band broke up, bringing Big Star's first era to its end. Dickinson later said that he was nailed for indulging Alex on Big Star third, but I think it is important that the artist is enabled to perform with integrity. What I did for Alex was literally remove the yoke of oppressive production that he had been under since the first time he ever uttered a word into a microphone, for good or ill. Since quitting the band in 1972, Bell had spent time in several different countries trying to develop his solo career. In 1978, after his return to Memphis, the first two big star albums were released together in the UK as a double album, drawing enthusiastic reviews and interest from fans. Soon afterwards Big Star's recognition grew further when, four years after its completion, the third album too was released in both the US and the UK. By now, the hitherto untitled Third Sister Lovers had become known by several unofficial names including Third, Bill Street Green and Sister Lovers. Not long after the release of Third Sister Lovers, Bell died in a car accident. He apparently lost control of his car while driving alone and was killed when he struck a lamp post after hitting the curb a hundred feet before. A blood test found that he was not drunk at the time, 
and no drugs were found on him other than a bottle of vitamins. Bell is believed to have either fallen asleep at the wheel or become distracted. Second Era, 1993-2011, Big Star returned in 1993 with a new lineup when guitarist John Auer and bassist Ken Stringfellow joined Chilton and Stevens. Auer and Stringfellow remain members of the Posies, founded by the pair in 1986. Stringfellow is also known for his work with R.E.M. and the Minus Five. Hummel elected not to participate. First era material dominates big stars performances, with the occasional addition of a song from the 2005 album In Space. Stringfellow recalled that during the 1990s, we were working out the set list and we went to this little cafe. Little did I know we'd be playing that set for the next 10 years. The resurrected band made its debut at the 1993 University of Missouri Spring Music Festival. A recording of the performance was issued on CD by Zoo Records as Columbia, live at Missouri University. The concert was followed by tours of Europe and Japan, as well as an appearance on The Tonight Show. In Space was released on September 27, 2005 on the Recodisc label. Recorded during 2004, the album consists of new material mostly co-written by Chilton, Stevens, Auer and Stringfellow. Reviewing In Space Rolling Stone's David Frick first points out the context for its release, a world expecting that American Beatles ideal all over again from a band that achieved its power pop perfection when no one else was looking. In Frick's estimation, the seemingly unrealistic expectation is in part met, its here a euro in the jangly longing and ice wall harmonies of Lady Sweet. Frick finds though that such songs are interleaved with the eccentric R&B and demo quality glam rock that have made Chilton's solo records a mixed blessing, and that a whole new thing starts out like old T-Rex, then goes nowhere special. Warming nevertheless to the rough sunshine of best chance, Frick says in conclusion, in space is no number one record, but at its brightest, it is big star in every way. The band appeared at San Francisco's Fillmore Auditorium on October 20, 2007. San Francisco-based band Oranger, performed as opening act. Big Star performed at the 2008 Rhythm Festival, staged from 29 Euro August 31 in Bedfordshire, UK. On June 16, 2009, the number one a record Radio City double album was reissued in remastered form. The same month, it was announced that a film of Big Star's history, based on biographer Rob Jovanovic's book Big Star, The Story of Rock's Forgotten Band, is in pre-production. On July 1, 2009, Big Star performed at a concert in Hyde Park, London, UK. On September 15, 2009, Rhino Records issued a four-CD box set containing 98 recordings made between 1968 and 1975. Keep an Eye on the Sky includes live and demo versions of Big Star songs, solo work, and material from Bell's earlier bands Rock City and Icewater. On November 18, 2009, the band performed at the Brooklyn Masonic Temple in New York City. Chilton died on March 17, 2010 after being admitted to hospital with heart problems. Big Star had been scheduled to play at SXSW Music Festival that same week. The remaining members, Joined by special guests original bassist Andy Hummel, M. Ward, Evan Dando, R.E.M.'s Mike Mills, and Chris Stamey, staged the concert as a tribute to him. Big Star was also scheduled to play in Memphis at Overton Park on May 15. The band did not cancel, instead turning it into a hometown tribute show which included guests Brendan Benson, John Davis, Mills, and many others. Hummel was too ill to attend. Hummel who was diagnosed with cancer in 2008, died on July 19, 2010. Asked about the band's future plans, Stevens told Billboard, It's music we all really love to play, and we love to play it together, so we're trying to figure out a way forward where we can keep doing it. After the EP live tribute to Alex Chilton was released in June 2011, Stevens wrote on the Ardent blog that the tribute performance in May 2010 was the last performance for Big Star as a band. On July 3, 2013, the documentary Nothing Can Hurt Me was released in theaters. Musical style and influences, Bell took up guitar when 12 or 13, 
but only on hearing the first Beatles records was he motivated to play the instrument regularly. He acted as lead and rhythm guitarist and vocalist for a sequence of bands, performing songs by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Zombies and the Animals. Chilton's first awareness of music came at the age of six when his brother repeatedly played a record by the Coasters. His father's liking for jazz then exposed him over the next few years to the music of Glenn Miller, Ray Charles and Dave Brubeck. Chilton's enthusiasm for music took hold when at age 13 he first heard Beatles records. He recalled having known of 1950s rock and roll but by 1959 Elvis was syrup and Jerry Lee was pretty much gone, and the rockabilly thing was sort of over so I didn't get really caught up in the rock scene until the Beatles came along. Chilton took up electric guitar at 13, playing along with Beatles songs, later saying, I really loved the mid-60s British pop music. All two and a half minutes or three minutes long, really appealing songs. So I've always aspired to that same format, that's what I like. Not to mention the rhythm and blues and the Stax stuff too. Chilton abandoned his guitar playing when with the box tops, then took up the instrument again. He met Roger McGuinn, guitarist for the Birds, and developed particular interest in electric guitar and acoustic folk. Stevens enjoyed the music of Otis Redding, the Isley Brothers, the Who, the Kinks and, in particular, the Beatles. He first played drums at home with his brother, then with a handful of bands in the years before Big Star formed. Hummel likewise was a member of more than one band during his early musical years, again influenced by the Beatles and other British invasion acts. The bassist also played acoustic guitar for personal enjoyment, following the styles of Simon and Garfunkel and Joni Mitchell and using finger-picking techniques to play folk and bluegrass. Most songs on the first three albums are credited to either Bell Chilton or Chilton, but some credit Hummel, Stevens and others, as either writer or co-writer. At the only seven live performances in the original era, the last of which took place before the second album's release, all four members contributed vocally. While primarily inspired by the music of the Beatles and other British invasion bands, acknowledging to the jangle pop and power pop of the period, Big Star also incorporated dark, nihilistic themes to produce a striking blend of musical and lyrical styles. The body of work resulting from the first era was a precursor of the alternative rock of the 1980s and 1990s, at the same time yielding material today considered an outstanding example of power pop. The stylistic range is evident from modern-day critiques. Bogdan Bayal, commenting on number one a record in their all-music guide to rock, perceive in the ballad of El Gudo a luminous, melancholy ballad, whereas John Borrock's ultimate power pop guide singles out Radio City's September Girls as a glorious, glittering jewel of power pop. Borrock notes too that Third Sister Lovers is slower, darker and a good deal weirder than the first two albums, identifying Holocaust as Alex Chilton at his haunting best, yet finds Thank You Friends exemplifying left field gems also present in which the hooks are every bit as undeniable as before. Jovanovic writes that when recording what Peter Buckley in his Rough Guide to Rock terms the snarling guitar rock of the first albums Don't Lie to Me, the band, deeming conventional instruments inadequate for the task, will two Norton commando motorcycles into the studio and gun the engines to intensify the song's bridge. Bogdan Bale reserves snarl for a Radio City song, Mod Lang. Here Buckley writes that the power of the performance and the erratic mix gave a sense of chaos which only added to the thrill. Legacy and Influence Although Big Star's first era came to an end in 1974, the band acquired a cult following in the 1980s when new acts began to acknowledge the early material's significance. R.E.M.'s Peter Buck admitted, We've sort of flirted with greatness but we've yet to make a record as good as Revolver or Highway 61 Revisited or Exile on Main Street or Big Stars Third. I don't know what it'll take to push us onto that level, but I think we've got it in us. Chilton, however, told an interviewer in 1992, I'm constantly surprised that people fall for Big Star the way they do. People say Big Star made some of the best rock and roll albums ever. And I say they're wrong. Today, Critics cite Big Star's first three albums as a profound influence on subsequent musicians. 
Rolling Stone notes that Big Star created a seminal body of work that never stopped inspiring succeeding generations of rockers, from the power pop revivalists of the late 1970s to alternative rockers at the end of the century to the indie rock nation in the new millennium. Jason Ankney, music critic for Allmusic, identifies Big Star as one of the most mythic and influential cult acts in all of rock and roll, whose impact on subsequent generations of indie bands on both sides of the Atlantic is surpassed only by that of the Velvet Underground. Ankney describes Big Star's second album, Radio City, as their masterpiece Euro ragged and raw guitar pop infused with remarkable intensity and spontaneity. In 1992, Recodisc generated further interest in the band when it reissued Third Sister Lovers and released a posthumous compilation of Bell's solo material, I Am the Cosmos. In his 2007 book Shake Some Action, The Ultimate Power Pop Guide, John Borick ranks the number one a record Radio City double album at No. 2 in his chart The 200 Greatest Power Pop Albums. Rolling Stone includes number one record. Radio City and Third Sister Lovers in the 500 Greatest Albums of All Time and September Girls, and 13 in the 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. In addition to R.E.M., artists including Teenage Fan Club, The Replacements, Primal Scream, The Posies, and Bill Lloyd and the Decibels cite Big Star as an inspiration, and the band's influence on game theory, Matthew Sweet and Velvet Crush is also acknowledged. Big Star's I'm In Love With A Girl From Radio City features in the soundtrack of the 2009 film Adventureland. The 2006 tribute album Big Star, Small World includes Big Star covers by The Posies, Teenage Fan Club, Gin Blossoms, Wilco, Afghan Wigs, Wise Key Town and others. The 1987 tribute song Alex Chilton, co-written by three members of The Replacements, was released as a single from the album Please to Meet Me and contains the lyric I never travel far without a little big star. In 1998, an ad hoc, shortened version of number one records in the street was used as the theme song for the sitcom That 70s Show, and in 1999, a new version titled That 70s Song was recorded by Cheap Trick also specifically for the show. That 70s Song and Big Star's own September Girls are included on the 1999 album That 70s Album released by the television program's producers. September Girls, Borak says, was and is the sine qua non of power pop, a glorious, glittering jewel with every facet cut and shined to absolute perfection. A peerless, aching distillation of love and longing. September Girls may not actually be the greatest song ever recorded, but for the duration of its 2.47 running time, you can be forgiven for believing it is. In 2012, a documentary titled Big Star, Nothing Can Hurt Me, directed by Drew DeNicola and Olivia Mori, chronicled the group's career and band member solo efforts. Personnel, Alex Chilton a Euro guitars, piano, vocals, Jody Stephens a Euro drums, vocals, Chris Bell a Euro guitars, vocals, Andy Humler Euro bass guitar, vocals, John Lightman a Euro bass guitar, backing vocals, John Unra a Euro guitar, vocals, Ken Stringfellow a Euro bass guitar, vocals, Timeline. Discography, Studio Albums, Number One Record, Radio City, Third Sister Lovers, In Space, Live Albums, Live, Columbia, Live at Missouri University 493, Nobody Can Dance A Euro Rehearsals and Live Recordings, Live Tribute at the Levitt Shell A Euro Big Star with John Davis, Compilations, Biggest A Euro Greatest Hits, The Best Off A Euro Greatest Hits, Big Star Story A Euro Greatest Hits with One New Track, Keep An Eye on the Sky A Euro Box Set with a Live Disc, Nothing Can Hurt Me A Euro Soundtrack to Movie, Playlist A Euro First Compilation to Cover All Eras of Band, Notes References, Ankney, Jason. Big Star Biography. Olmasic.com. Access June 29, 2009. Bogdan, Vladimir, Woodstra, Chris, Eliween, Stephen Thomas. All Music Guide to Rock, The Definitive Guide to Rock, Pop, and Soul. Backbeat Books, 2002. ISBN 978-0-87930-653-3 Borak, John M. Shake Some Action, The Ultimate Power Pop Guide. 
Shake Some Action A Euro Power Pop, 2007. ISBN 978-0-9797714-0-8. Buckley, Peter. The Rough Guide to Rock. Rough Guides, 2003. ISBN 978-1-84353-105-0. Eaton, Bruce. Big Stars Radio City. Continuum International Publishing Group Limited, 2009. ISBN 978-0-8264-2898-1. Gordon, Robert. It Came From Memphis. New York, Pocket Books, 1995. ISBN 0-7434-1045-9. Jovanovic, Rob. Big Star, The Story of Rock's Forgotten Band. London, Fourth Estate, 2004. ISBN 0-00-714908-5. External links, official website, Big Star at DMOZ.